So first, before going diving to the publication, first we would like to discuss the motivation of this work. As we all know, 3D models have been huge demand in, across different industry verticals like visual reality, design industry, and gaming, etc. In all these industries, like designers want to optimize their design space with the available content and to generate the new instances of this content. So uh, we need low, there is a huge surge in research also, like where they want to generate the new content uh, using different uh, computer vision techniques. The first one would be likelihood-based models, likelihood-free models, or implicit generative models. These are the categories which have been in research where the generation is taking place. Uh, normally in generative models, we try to learn the actual distribution of this data and create the new instances. At first, in likelihood-based models, uh, you try to learn this actual data representation of these 3D shapes uh, by maximizing the likelihood of this given data distribution. And likelihood free models, uh, um, we know it is like GANs, uh, where we play a, uh, the models employ a two player min max game to obtain the Nash equilibrium. So, likelihood based models are like diffusion models, normalizing flows, energy based models, and in likelihood frame models are like GANs. And the third uh, generative models, which uh, nowadays is uh, having a huge popularity, is implicit generative models where you represent the data implicitly and instead of learning this uh, data distribution of the shapes you learn the neural fields uh, which represents the 3d scenes or 3d objects so and we will discuss further about this generative models in the further slides but the, our work is majorly focused on implicit generative models because of the its advantages over the other generative models and when we are dealing with this generation we have two questions to effectively represent a 3D data uh, in a generative model, you need to represent it effectively, right? So in 2D, it is very easy because it's, we have well-known pixel grids which to represent the images. And here in 3D, there are like a lot of data representations available and we need to model an effective data representation so that our generative model can utilize it and can form more uh, diverse new instances of generative data. So, and also, these models have certain limitations, like likelihood-based models, which are this super slow, and like likelihood-free models, which have often has mode collapse problems. And even in implicit models, there are certain limitations, which we will be discussing further. So now, next, what is like? First, we would like to discuss the data representations. What are the available data representations? Voxels. Uh, Voxels are pretty similar to images in 2D space like pixels in 2D space. In 3D, we have this uh, cuboid unit, which represents the occupancy of this particular uh, 3D shape, whether of geometry, whether it is present or not by using an oxal representation. Uh, uh, they're pretty much uh, similar to pixels in 2D. That's why they are more compatible for the deep learning networks or deep convolution networks uh, to utilize them. The uh, major uh, disadvantage is like uh, the shape is quite restricted by the resolution of these voxels. Uh, you can represent the fine grain structures of a 3D shape by going to higher resolutions, but this further improves the computational cost in processing them. And the next one is well-known data, which is point cloud. Uh, we know we can directly get any point cloud data directly from the depth map, so which is readily available data. It requires less processing than the other kind of representations in 3D. Uh, but the problem is like they are in order, like they're not in order. So they are an order invariant. So mostly to make them in order invariant. So you need specific type of data processing uh, to order the points in a canonical space and later further apply the deep learning neural networks on them. And they are also not very suitable for uh, representing the high resolution data. So mostly they are restricted to certain number of points in particular research. So these are the problems with the point clouds. And meshes, uh, which is very well known and traditional computer graphics representation, and which is more suitable for 3D shapes actually. But the, their compatibility with um, deep neural networks is not so good because in mesh representations you have, have this vertices and phases. So when you want to generate the content or represent the content using deep neural networks, you need to learn an additional uh, connections between these vertices when representing the mesh directly, which becomes more difficult. And also it is a non-Euclidean data, which makes it further difficult. 
for in processing you are using the deep neural networks. And the next comes the implicit representation, which is uh, recently uh, many people are trying to do. Uh, instead of explicitly representing the shape, we implicitly represent it by having the boundary conditions of particular points on a 3D shape. For suppose occupancy fields, uh, here every point in space uh, will have an occupancy value, like whether it is present on this uh, level set or not. If the point is present on the shape, it is occupied as one. If it is not, it is maintained as zero. So there is like, it is what uh, the function is represented here. The decision boundary is represented by the deep neural network classifier as uh, whether it uh, shape the point in particular space is present on the surface or not. And contrary, there is another implicit representation, which is also a condition on the decision boundary of this 3D surface, uh, which is SDF, uh, sign distance field. Instead of having this occupancy, here you have a distance value, which measures the distance between this 3D point in space to the respective closest surface. So this uh, distance value will represent the uh, zero level set of the function. If the zero level set of the function is awkward on this and the surface is extracted. Here you can clearly see the red and the blue. If the SDR value is more than zero, that means it is outside the surface and uh, outside the surface boundary of this particular rabbit bunny. And if it is the inside, and that is uh, zero, uh, less than zero. And zero level set is exactly the surface we are extracting using uh, several rendering techniques. So the disadvantage here is they both this kind of representations uh, want the water type models or can only represent the water type models. But unfortunately, in real world, not all the data is uh, water type. So you will be having non water type models also uh, so more abundantly. So in order to represent them, you have to either have to make it water type and then represent, which is not exactly the representation we need. Uh, and also this can only represent the outer shells of a 3D models. That means suppose uh, uh, there is a car and you need you want to see the internal represent the chairs and steering inside the car, it can these models can only mostly uh, can only describe or represent the outer boundary of a car, but not the internal geometries involved in it. The possible solution could be unsight distance function. This seems very simple. Uh, like, but when adopting to deep neural networks, uh, it becomes little non-trivial, which we will explain in the later slides. So here, unsigned distance function is a distance again, distance field again, but it is a distance between a point and the closest surface and with no sign. In SDF, we have sign to represent whether it flips, the point flips inside or outside the surface, but in an unsigned distance function, you don't have any um, this flipping. So you don't have any negative sign or agnostic sign uh, symbol to represent whether it is inside or outside. You just have a distance value with respect to the closest surface. And again, here the surface is also extracted uh, as a zero level set. And how do we do that with uh, even with representation of the sign will be explained in further. So related work, uh, mostly in implicit representation models in occupancy and SDF, here you can see the two works with Menchander and Perk, uh, the 2019 papers where they represented this 3D surfaces using deep neural network classifiers, which are basically an MLP of E forward layers to predict the occupancies of a 3D shape of a particular point and also SDF values, uh, which represented actually quite well uh, the 3D data. Um, because it's continuous representation, implicit uh, models and theory also have an advantage that they can represent diverse topologies with a, like uh, different resolutions. So which is a very huge, huge benefit for a 3D representation of 3D data. But like our task is like here, want to, I want to adopt the UDF. Uh, so what are that? And first, before going to UDF, like SDF, what we'll do normally in a neural network, how do we present these distances is we sample some points of the 3D uh, shape with some SDF points, and then we pass it to an MLP or a feed forward layer or new imp implicit layer, and we overfit these points to predict the distances with respect to the surface. And this is how the occupancy fields also works. Um, and in sign distance function, actually many people use sign distance function and there are also some improvements in sign distance uh, representation of 3D shape uh, to represent the 3D shape quite well. And also there have been attempts to uh, represent the non-water type shapes too. 
like if suppose like normally from because of this flipping between inside outside marching cubes we can use directly on this sdr fields and can extract the shape of this 3d uh, whatever the 3d shape we have and the limiter they're not also limited to watertight surfaces so which is a limitation for us for representing the non watertight shapes and they're also uh, quite things like uh, there are works like need and 3 psdf which came in 2022 uh, there, they introduced a null operator. Like instead of like in inside and outside, there is also a label called null, uh, which can uh, describe the watertight shapes. But the problem is, in order to insert this uh, null operator under the label into an SDF, you need a tensor sampling, uh, and also even though you have and when you are using mass cube, you remove this null operator and then you extract the shape. So this can lead to many artifacts. So we need a better representation than this. So here comes the unsigned distance fields. Here you can see the images both side by side, which is one unsigned distance field, another is signed distance field. You can clearly see it is a, I don't know how visible it is in the slides, but there is like clear description of the surfaces in the 2D by the unsigned distance field when compared to the signed distance field. And uh, here, this is also mentioned like in STF, you can only represent the closed surfaces without using this null label, extra label, which uh, some works have been done. But uh, NDF, without adding any external label and with uh, just being uh, sign agnostic, it can represent the closed surfaces, open surfaces, functions, manifolds, and complex themes. So here, we want to utilize the representation power of the unsigned distance field in generating shapes. Uh, so far, we have seen that it is able to represent these kind of very diverse uh, topologies and the shapes of different uh, instances. Uh, so we want to use this in generative mode. So that's our major contribution of this work. And uh, utilizing this, uh, uh, maybe we can think like, OK, STF is having a sign and unsigned distance field is having no sign. So it might be easy for us to adopt this kind of thing. No, because. Uh, as there is no sign, there are some challenges included. So we have to carefully involve a loss, uh, uh, sign agnostic loss function and in carefully initialize it to learn the uh, unsigned distance field when using a neural representation to learn unsigned distance field and then generate it. So there, that's why learning an unsigned distance field is a little difficult, but is more effective when representing both watertight and non-watertight data with the finer details. So next, first, why do we need this kind of representation? Because we want to represent the shapes with the diverse uh, topologies. That means the nested surfaces. Uh, suppose here you can see the inter there is a bus uh, here, and you can represent only the outer shell of a bus. That means the boundary, uh, boundary, boundary of this particular 3D shape using sign distance function. Uh, and you can only, uh, or occupancy field, but we need number of seats inside them and like everything to be generated and represented very well. That's why we need this unsigned distance field. And also, what if the shapes are non watertight as mentioned before, we need like a perfect representation for that. And the other problem is we cannot directly use marching cubes, uh, traditional algorithms to render shapes. So we have a uh, Shibani, uh, the NDF work, neural distance field works, which used uh, an algorithm to create meshes from UDF, so which we would be using in our work to generate the meshes. And yes, uh, okay, representation is okay. Now, how we will use this representation to generate the 3D shapes? There comes the important question of our work. So the major contributions of this work are like implicit, it is an implicit uh, neural generative work for generating the nested surfaces with the finer details. And other uh, mode also learns both watertight and non-watertight, which is also another contribution. And we further curate a new data set. In 3D, we have like lot of data sets, but none of them are like completely into nested 3D surfaces. We want to have a data set which is having different topologies and nested surfaces so that we can show our method can work and also generate this internal shapes with huge diversity. That's why we curated a data set named uh, full cast. We call it full cast further on uh, by segregating it from the shape net data set. Okay, now comes to the main focus of the work, our methodology. So, for our method, our method is a two-step generative process. So here we have uh, 
first gener step generative process in the first horizontal line and the second one contributes to the generation. So I would like to go first. Uh, first stage training. In first stage training, our input is a voxelized point cloud. So we fit it into the implicit uh, encoder. That means uh, every uh, we have different stages of this uh, multiple resolution architecture, multi-scale architecture, which learns the shape at various uh, varied resolutions and different channel information. That means you need information not only uh, segregate the information of course details to find the details in a multi-scale architectural way. You learn all these in features using 3D CNNs. Our implicit encoder is completely bordered with 3D CNNs uh, with the multiple uh, scale architectures and multi resolutions. So when you have all the context, local context of this shape learned by the 3D CNNs uh, into this multiple scales of information, you concatenate them into a global uh, latent space and which we call it as a Z. Z is a continuous latent representation of this 3D shape. And OK, so far, so OK. We have a continuous latent representation, which is rich in local context information of a 3D shape. But further, when we want to utilize this continuous latent representation, uh, we would need a suitable generation technique for that. And learning this continuous representation of uh, uh, shapes, 3D shape information or the geometry is uh, computationally very expensive. We can also we think of a way to discretize that. Uh, so that our computation can be effective, but yet have the details of this uh, uh, high end details of this uh, continuous latent representation. I think everyone is aware of VQVAE works, which is a vector quantized variational autoencoders, where you quantize the latent representation into discrete features and then use these discrete features to represent uh, uh, images or like 3D shapes, etc. So we use the same technique. So we quantize. That means we had a code book, uh, which uh, basically is initialized. Uh, and you have this auto encoder features. So we for every feature of this continuous representation, every code in it, we search for a suitable nearest code book entry. And when this nearest code book entry is been decided, and then we have this index of code books stored. So this nearest code book entry is for the discrete and then given as a sequence. That means like your maybe you have a continuous latent representation of, of 16 cube into 497. Then you have a code book for every latent code in this particular thing. Uh, you have a respective discrete code, which is further uh, sent as an uh, same resolution 16 cube 497 with a discrete code representation to the decoder. And then your decoder will represent the shape. Uh, in the form of a unsigned distance field by predicting the distance values of this particular sampled points P with respect to these features. And this from this unsigned distance field, when you travel, you have the gradients and when you extract the gradients pointing towards to the surface, you extract the point cloud from it. And so here in the first stage, because of this implicit uh, autoencoder and the decoder, decoder is here all, all just a feed forward layer. As mentioned before, we want some sample features or the points and we want to have the field work. So here we have simple feed forward layers, but in encoder is a real part here because we have multi-scale architecture which has a different local context information of a 3D shape. So we have to utilize this um, discrete or the continuous uh, latent representation of this 3D shapes in generation mode. And here you can see the loss function mentioned, uh, which is the first stage loss function we utilized here. And the first one is just a reconstruction loss between the UDFs of the ground truth UDFs and also the predicted UDFs of our first stage. And the second one is called commitment loss. Here uh, we have a pro uh, small problem because as we are having the quantization operation, which involves argmax or argmin operators, which are non-differentiable, so the gradient flow, the backward pass is like stopped, halted here. So we want the effective flow of our gradients. So for that, we utilize a scheme called straight through gradient estimation. So that means basically here we have a threshold which is bypassed uh, in the backward pass. So here you can see we want to copy this uh, gradients of this decoder to the encoder directly. 
So Streiter estimator is nothing but the gradients computed along the or learned along the training procedure of the this first test training process. We need to copy them to the encoder. So for that, we use the straight through gradient estimation. And here you can see this after the gradients has been copied and we further process the training and uh, we learn the rich latent representation of this 3D shape embeddings. We, when we get this all these 3D shape embeddings of diverse 3D shapes, we use it as a data set uh, for our second stage uh, training process. In the second stage planning process, as the code book is already learned with the dis discrete codes, which are representing diverse uh, latent shape embeddings, we want to use this latent shape embeddings to learn, um, so learn. And why do we use the only latent transformer? Why can't we go for other generative models? We, there is a reason behind it. See, suppose we have local context information, but what about the long range dependencies between this local context? Suppose, for example, so you have a disc, uh, discrete representation which is, represents diverse shapes. What happened in the relation between this seat and the steering? What happens to the relation between local context of this back seat with the wheels? And what about the position of this thing, uh, each individual structure in a 3D shape? So we need to learn the, not only encode the information uh, to learn all the local information, but to, to build a relation between these long range dependencies of local context, we need some self attention mechanism, which is very suitable for this purpose to learn the long range dependencies. We have also seen in research, it has been very much utilized in research as a token transformer, latent transformer to build this really, relations between the input using the self-attention mechanism. Therefore, we employ the latent transfer information. So now from the first stage of training, we have the latent embeddings, which has the 3D shape information and with rich intrinsic detail. So we formulate it as a sequence. So when we give a random sequence and having the information of this latent shape embeddings, we need uh, we try to learn this uh, latent shape embeddings uh, using the trans latent transformer for the generation. So when in the second stage, the first stage is uh, completely frozen. The weights of the first stage training is completely frozen and we utilize the latent transformer uh, in generation process and which we will explain in the next slide. So here you can see we give like partial sequence or like completely random sequence. So we first feed with a start token and then we want to thereby predict the second token in an autoregressive way using the latent transformer to complete a complete shape uh, sequence, which will represent our 3D shape. So here this um, training objective is to maximize the likelihood of this uh, already available information of latent shape embeddings uh, using this uh, transformer. And yeah. Uh, here we can also have two, stay, uh, two steps. When you give a random sequence, it will give you diverse samples. But when you train a network using the partial sequences in a reconstructive way, it could also be used in a shape completion work. Yes. And now comes to experiments. We have experimented on uh, different data sets, like ShapeNet data set, which is very hugely popular. And many everyone use the uh, ShapeNet data set for generation and show their diverse results on how many shapes it has been generated. And uh, full cusp, as we said, we curate a data set from the shape net and uh, which involves only internal details so that we can say, OK, our model is uh, hugely advantageous. So when you generate the stuff with internal details. And here we also used uh, so, some metrics to determine our generation of work. And in generation, basically, like no metric have 100% defined the diversity or like uh, uh, how realistic the samples are. These are the metrics more hugely used in research. So I have also used the same uh, quantitative results to show that our generation results are better. So minimum matching distance. So basically minimum matching distance, what it shows is how realistic uh, the samples, generated samples are with the input distribution. That's what it measures. So if the minimum matching distance is very less, that means it is more realistic sample. It generates more realistic samples. And the other one is coverage. Uh, it coverage is how much of diverse content it has been generated when compared to the input data distribution, how diverse it is and uh, how many different shapes have been generated. So it's basically to evaluate the sample diversity. And next is Jensen, uh, Jensen-Shannon divergence, which we all know, which uh, 
basically uh, calculates the symmetry between similarity between different distributions, the generated distribution and the different distribution. So lower JSD me is always desired. That means the similarity is uh, less. So, and it is also, there is a drawback, which depends upon the reference set you, you choose or the different data set you chose when computing, evaluating the tensile Shannon divergence. So here, and the other question is, so, so far so nice. We can go back here. Uh, when you are saying this latent representation, uh, we are considering a resolution, like the latent resolution of 16 cube. And uh, why can't we go for higher resolution? That is a question we can impose to ourselves. Uh, we can go, but computationally it increases, cubically it increases as the latent space here is modulated in a volumetric uh, representation. So the computation increases uh, like that. And also, so therefore we have this ablation study uh, where we have chosen different, uh, in the first stage of training, chosen different uh, latent resolutions. Like here, you can see this is 64 cube and 16 cube and 8 cube. So with the same latent embedding dimension, 497. So the shapes you can see, the first one, you can clearly see the speeds and the steering in the re reconstruction auto encoding performance of the first stage. And in the second stage, you can clearly see, but not as much as the first stage. But in this glass with the 8 cube, your shape is already shattered. You cannot clearly see the seats anymore. So therefore, to bring the trade off between this uh, fidelities and the memory footprint, uh, we chose 16 cube as the latent uh, volumetric representation resolution we need for the latent dimension uh, to represent the shapes. And now comes to the results. Uh, here, like you can see our qualitative results. Uh, of the point cloud generation. Our method is also able to produce qualitative point clouds and also the mesh results. So uh, here I show some point cloud results, which are sampled for 2048 points. And you can see clearly these are all generated results with the different shapes and different information, geometrical information and different. So this shows our high quality point cloud generation results when used to our method with respect to other uh, state of the art point cloud generation results like graph, CNN GAN, diffusion, and point flow. And here, and we can see the generative results of meshes and also the point clouds uh, with respect to our full cast data set. As, we, as you can see, uh, it's quite surprising how the uh, in, internal information is learned according to the outer shape. Uh, I would assume it is basically due to our long range dependencies, modulating a transformer for learning the long range dependencies. Because here you can see it's the normal car with the seats and the back seats and the steering. Uh, and it is perfectly generated sample and it's not even a represented sample. So, uh, and here you can see it is minivan and it can able to generate like three seaters inside a van and the model is able to understand this information and like generate this sample. And you can see a Jeep like structure and a sports car. And here the problem, the mesh results are not so effective because I used a different algorithm to, as I mentioned, there is no direct algorithm for unsigned distance fields to render directly using the marching cube. So I used out of, of the shell methods like mesh lab to generate this uh, meshes. Maybe if I can use some uh, conventional algorithms directly like marching cubes or if you could employ the results would have been even better. And here again, I would like, I want to show like uh, how it is in the point structure. Here I show dense point clouds and meshes. What about if it is with the current state of the art uh, sampled with the 2048 points, how does it look? How does the, our model define the shape when compared to the other generative models? Here you can see a diffusion model, point flow and graph, and also the full former, which is an implicit representation. You can clearly see our model can benefit from this implicit representation and also low signal state loss functions and this transformer uh, network. So which is a hybrid setup of like all this combination suits to be perfect for generating the shapes. Uh, and you can clearly see the chairs and the steering and the uh, wheels here. And here are some quantitative results. As I said, like MMT coverage and GSD are the metrics I chose for uh, evaluating the quantitatively our method. And you can see graph CNN, GAN, diffusion. And uh, here are the comparative methods. As you can see, our method performed better in MMD and coverage, and also in subfullcast GSD. Uh, 
uh, so showing that it can generate diverse samples and also realistic samples and also matching to the distribution of the learned data. And so in conclusion, I would like to say our method is a two-stage generative process. In first stage, you learn an autoencoder, which is capable of representing diverse shapes and topologies. And um, we use an implicit representation, a continuous implicit representation to learn or parameterize these points of this 3D shapes. And when learning this latent shape embeddings, we discretize them to make use of a transformer, which works well in a discrete setup. A uh, latent transformer from start giving a random sequence and learning token by token until it finishes a complete sequence, which can represent a diverse 3D shape. And yes, uh, there are some drawbacks, which I could also explain as a feature scope here. Uh, when you want to improve your work, when you want to improve your course to find sampling strategy in multi-scale operation, if you could, you could benefit by having an effective sampling strategy. So it could speed up the computation and it can also go for high resolutions if we could do that. And the continuous uh, latent representation also has like improve, the, always better than discrete because in discrete you are using quantization so you will lose some information, which would be more effective if I can use a continuous latent representation in generation without using a discrete token. And other would be in future, we could also do the text guided 3D generation. That means suppose you need internal stuff, like you have a car and you want different seatings. So you can just give the model like, okay, I want some particular Toyota car with four seats. I want Toyota with six seats. So that's what you can do in the future. And thanks for listening. And code and paper is available at the particular repository.